Because of the high pressures involved with nitrogen tanks, you must use a pressure regulator when flushing with dry nitrogen, and you must use sweat-in valves. The regulator and the hoses must be in good condition. Ensure the hoses aren't frayed or swelled at the connections. You have to flush the high and low side separately. Cut out the high side at the compressor discharge and the hot tube discharge at the dryer. Most servicers like to cut in right at the point where they attached a line tap so they don't have to weld that hole later. Connect a sweat-in valve to the hot tube discharge. You'll connect here so that you can flush the system in the reverse direction of its normal flow. Be sure to remove the Schrader valve stems if you're sweating these connectors on. The heat from the process will ruin the valve seats. Leave these stems out during the flushing process to provide greater flow through the system. The high side cannot take more than 250 pounds of pressure. Open the regulator until the pressure reaches about 200. That's sufficient to do the job. Place a white cloth over the other end of the tubing to see what's coming out. A contaminated system will flush out dark brown burnt oil. Continue flushing until what comes out is clean and free of contaminants. Then close the regulator and wait until the system bleeds down the remaining nitrogen. Flushing the low side is the same except that the pressure on the low side cannot exceed 150 pounds. In addition to looking for a clean discharge from the cap tube, you are also looking for a good strong flow out of the tube. Once you've got that, shut down the regulator and disconnect your equipment. The next step is to reconnect the system, pump it down, and recharge it. Flushing with 134A has some drawbacks, one of which is the need to recover that refrigerant as you flush. So flushing with 134A requires using two process tools on each side. This procedure is designed to flush each side with 8 ounces of refrigerant so that a high side flush and a low side flush will total 16 ounces and will fit into a 24 ounce recovery bag along with the 6.5 ounces of refrigerant that you may have recovered from the system already. It's critical that you not overinflate these bags. Doing so by as little as two ounces may rupture the bag. First, cut out the high side at the compressor discharge and the hot tube discharge at the dryer. The cap tube is too small for a tube cutter, so etch it with a file and break it off. And make sure you haven't collapsed the opening. Connect a process tool to each end, or if you use sweat-in valves, be sure to remove the Schrader valve stems before sweating these connectors on. The heat from this process will ruin the valve seats. Leave these stems out during the flushing process to provide greater flow through the system. Connect the recovery bag here and the dial charge here so that you can flush the system in the reverse direction of its normal flow. Open the dial charge and open the valve. Continue flushing until the discharge into the bag is clean. Then shut off the dial charge and let the remaining refrigerant drain into the bag. Next, connect to the low side at the compressor suction line and at the cap tube and connect process tools. It's important to flush in the normal direction of refrigerant flow on the low side. Feeding refrigerant in the opposite direction would increase the chances of contaminants getting caught in the cap tube. Open the dial charge and then the valve and watch the discharge flowing into the bag. When it's clear, you can shut off the dial charge and let the system bleed down. But if you've encountered a badly contaminated system in which the oil is dark brown and of a sugary consistency, you may not have enough pressure with 134A to blow the contamination out through the cap tube. In these situations, you'll save time by simply replacing the evaporator.